All right. Another Sunday interview. Uh, today we got Brendan from Master Talk. Something I, I watch all the time, man. I suggest everybody check out the YouTube channel. Brendan, how you doing today? It's very kind for you to say that, Joe. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm amazing. How about you? I know you're amazing, but how are you feeling? <laughs> I'm always feeling good, man. You know, just just the usual grind, doing a bunch of beatings, helping a lot of people, adding value wherever I can. That's good. That's good. Uh, you, I see you're a little casual today. Usually on your YouTube videos, you're like dressed up to the T. What's going on? Yeah, Love dude. For the Alabama people. <laughs> No, nah, man, I, I think I think what I like, I like to keep things casual with my podcast interviews so people can kind of get both sides of me. You know, if I always put a suit on all the time, I would, I would look a bit, uh, you know, off, off. It's, it's, it's kind of off brand. That's why I like the casual vibe, too, so people can get to know the other side. Yeah, this eventually will go on, be on a podcast, but like I discussed this before, your casual side will be on YouTube. So totally fine. Everybody's going to see it. I hope you like it. Oh yeah, trust me. I've had worse. I, I I was giving interviews a couple months ago when I, I hadn't cut my hair in like four months because of COVID. So mm -hmm. my hair and if you type my name, like some of these interviews I've done, you see my hair is like all filled up like it's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, don't worry. I, I'm a pretty chill guy. Don't worry. Oh, I know, I know. Uh, you seem like a very cool guy on your YouTube page. Ah, uh, it's funny that you ah. Uh... Allow me to do this interview because uh, of course, seeing somebody with like a big intellect, and you can tell that I'm just a redneck from Alabama. So, uh, you, you know, it's funny. I I don't think you should ever talk yourself down, Joe. I think the reason, and the reason I started Mass Truck was for everybody. Right? I don't care if you're from Alabama or India. Right? It doesn't matter. Even if I just compared a state with a country, but I think so. I guess I'm I, you're the guy with the intellect, not me. But I think the idea is, uh, you know, just helping as many people as I can, and and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch my stuff. Oh, trust me, I wasn't talking myself down. I'm I'm a right neck from Alabama. <laughs> I wasn't insulting myself. I, I promise uh. you. Uh, okay, it's funny because you know uh being that uh my family is from new york uh and puerto rico it's funny because like i'm the the country of all country rosadas they're out you know my family's mostly puerto rican so when i get around them they're like Who, who's this gringo like, oh, i'm your nephew how you doing <laughs> but uh, i want to get started uh Master Talk. How did you get started with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what happened was when I went to university, Joe, and I was I was in business school. I used to do these things called case competitions. So think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So other guys my age were you know playing football or you know rugby or I don't know cricket or basketball or something. Things I'm clearly not equipped to do. I would I wouldn't even watch games. It's not my thing. But what I did instead was I would watch other people present, and that's what I did competitively for three years. So while other people were like uh, doing full ride scholarships in football or something at a at a Alabama State or any other university in the U.S., I was doing the same thing, but with presentations. I was presenting hundreds of times, and I'd coached a bunch of people. And then when I I joined Corporate America, or I guess in my case, Corporate Canada, <laughs> this is based in Montreal, which is a couple of hours off New York, I kind of just asked myself, what can I do to make an impact in the world? And that's when I had the idea for the YouTube channel because I realized, uh, especially since you were watching my stuff as well, that a lot of the content out there is, is pretty trash. It's really bad. You know, you see things like, uh, oh, Joe, you should like get up on stage or you should like picture everyone in their underpants or something useless. Like, it was really bad stuff. So I started making videos in my mother's basement and, and then one thing led to another. I got really good on camera. My production got better over time and here we are today. Yeah, um... I'm kind of, I'm kind of just gonna kill it with this production right here. I'm gonna stick with my tablet, and <laughs> that's about it, man. God. You know, a lot of people tell me all the time that I probably need to go to like a big camera or you know start, you know. I'm like, nah, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep it old fashioned, simple little tablet, you know. But it's funny because you know you learn a lot from your page, uh, just how it, you know. I, I do break a lot of your rules the way you present. Position your body, the way you talk. Yeah, uh, one uh, video we were just talking to, uh, talking about off camera, uh, how to make a boring topic interesting. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
I'm not kidding. Uh, well, actually, it was a couple months ago. I'm not going to tell you the topic of the interview because you'll figure it out. However, the guy just kept talking and talking and talking. And I remember looking at my social media consultant like, I can't get one question in because it, it was on Zoom. So he couldn't see me. He was talking, so the camera couldn't see me. But I kept looking at him and I was like, I can't get one question in. This is boring. I don't know what to do. And every time you try to talk over him, he'll just talk. I talk. He'll talk even louder. <laughs> if you if you watch the interview, which I can't tell you which interview it is, but it was just so boring. I didn't even want to put it on YouTube. And I remember watching your video, and I was like, I should have done this. I could have done that, and it would have been a lot better interview. But I didn't know where Master Talk was. So I mean, before we get started into the interview, if anybody wanted to watch Master Talk. Where, how would they do it? Yeah, absolutely. They can just type Master Talk in one word on YouTube and it should pop up. But if people want to message me directly, you can also message me on my Instagram page, which is Master Your Talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, you ever been to the U.S.? Oh, yeah. I, I go to the U.S. a lot. I was in uh, Los Angeles and San Diego in February. I go there a lot for work and for conferences. So I'm always going back and forth between the States and Canada. Well, California doesn't count. <laughs> California well, is a different country. That's, that's, they have, that's fair. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's fair. They, they just well, think like, because they, they, think, they think they're so smart there. They're, they think because they live near an ocean, they got, they're got educated. I'm just like, whatever, dude. It's a nice place uh, to be, I'm not going to lie. But okay, fine. Then I, I never took direct flights, so I guess I've been to, technically, I've been to Detroit, Michigan. I've been to Washington, D.C. because of the connection flights. But Right. <laughs> That's that's pretty much. I don't, hey, look, my sister lives in Alaska, and I used to visit her all the time. And I can't stay on a plane for eight hours. It's just I can't do it. Wow. So, if you think about all the times I've stopped in, you know, Cleveland and tech, you know, uh, Chicago or you know, Seattle. Yeah, you know, I can say I've been there, but you know, I never left the airport. There you go. Same here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what do you, what do you do for a living? You remind me asking. No, of course. No, dude, ask me anything. I'm, I'm a pretty open book. But yeah, my, my day job is I'm a technology consultant at IBM. So I'm sure you've, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the company. It's like a huge co computer company. And then outside of that, I, I, I work on Master Talk and I coach IT executives on communication and public speaking. Okay. So uh, do, you, do you collect clients? And, you know, if somebody wanted to be coached, do you ever do that? Yeah, so, so what happened with me, Joe, was, you know, like when I started the YouTube channel, I never really wanted to like build a business out of it. I was just making videos in my basement. And you could just see my first videos. I don't know if, you, if you've gone that far down, but like the first couple of videos that I uploaded was literally just in my basement. That's literally right over there, right in front of me. But over time, what happened was because of the quality of the videos I was putting out, at least I hope so anyways, a lot of C-level executives, so those are like CEOs of companies, executives, they started reaching out to me for coaching. So that's what I do now um, on the side. So And that's growing pretty quickly. So, so I guess what I would say for people who want coaching, I would start by watching the free videos first because speech coaches are really expensive. We're talking like, um, you know, most speech coaches in the industry charge, really good ones anyways, charge like three, $400 an hour, right? So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really expensive. So what, that's why I, made, I make these YouTube videos for people who can't afford those kinds of things. But uh, that's my take in general, yeah. So let me ask you this. Something like public speaking. Why are we afraid of that? that? That's a great question, Joe. It's one worth answering for sure. So, so the way that I see it is, you know, you know I've talked to people around the world, right? Whether it's uh, South Korea, Japan, you know, New Zealand, everywhere you go, we we all seem to be all scared of public speaking. We don't really know why. So let me add a bit more detail to that. Where does the fear of public speaking come from? And the answer for most of us is where we give most of our presentations, which is school, high school, college, university. It doesn't matter if you're a high school dropout or a PhD. Most of the ways that we learn our presentation habits start there. We don't wake up one morning and say, hey, Joe, you want to get breakfast today and present all day? Nobody does that, right? Because we don't see presentations as a fun thing to do. And in that school, let's say we're in high school together and we're sitting there, three things happen. One, the topic. We never get to pick the topic. 
It's never something we're passionate about. It's not something we care about, like the podcast that you care about right now, the interview. Number two, students don't care. Not because they don't care about us. We're great people here. We're just having a conversation. The issue is that they, they also have to present after us. So when we're presenting, they're sitting there in the classroom thinking, oh, crap, i got to go in 10 minutes. i got to do my own thing. i got to present my high school presentation too. So they're not paying attention to us. Number three, teachers. Teachers are very well-educated. Teachers are very well-intentioned. Teachers are also very stressed. 30 students, 40 students, 50 students, 60 students in a class. You've got two classes to go through all of them. So they're panic. You know, they have time to sit us down and coach us for 10 minutes and say, hey, Joe, let's work on your presentation. It doesn't happen. They don't have time for that. So let's recap. You never get to pick the topic. You're always presenting to students who don't want to listen to you. And you're always being coached by teachers who don't have time to coach you. And this behavior gets repeated in every subject. Math, sciences, arts, music, gym, on and on and on and on. We're taught to believe that public speaking is a chore. It's a responsibility. It's an obligation. If we're at school, it's tied to a grade. And if we're at work, it's tied to a result. And if we fail at any part of that journey, we get punished. Whether it's a lower grade at school or whether it's a promotion that we don't get at work. And that's the punchline, Joe. We need to understand that the fear of public speaking has nothing to do with us. It's not our fault. It's the fault of the system in which we grew up learning the skill in the first place. Now, let me ask you this. Do you feel that uh, people who were probably made fun of in school or didn't have a lot of friends, do you think those are the type of people that usually are afraid to do public speaking? I, I definitely think there's a component to that. I, I actually think even if you're extroverted, you're, you're, there's still a lot of you that is still afraid of public speaking. But on the topic you mentioned, that definitely doesn't help, right? In the sense of, you know, if you have that social anxiety, if you're already stressed to talk to people, that gets amplified in your presentations. And the way that you fix this, in my opinion, is by having a close-knit group of friends. Have two to three people that really care about you, that don't aren't bothered by the fact that you might make mistakes in your conversation. And that solid base of people gives you confidence to talk to anyone else. So if you think about me, I'm a bizarre character in the sense that I started a YouTube channel on public speaking at the age of 22, which is weird because most YouTubers start, vid start YouTube channels on vlogging or comedy. But then I started coaching CEOs of companies at 23. But I also speak three languages in karaoke and aid. I also dance alone in my basement an hour a day. I also live in my mother's basement, right? And I also don't plan on moving out of my mother's basement for another six years. So how do any of these decisions make sense? Where does that confidence come from to do all of these things, to communicate in this way? The confidence comes from my friends. You know, I've met thousands of people in my life based from this journey, but I've only, I only have six friends. Right? Those are the people who really understand me, who really know me. And it's the confidence that they give me that allows me to speak my truth to other people. Uh, with those six friends, you have much rapport with those friends. Now, how important is it to have rapport with the audience? Oh, it's an interesting transition. I mean, definitely important in the sense that one way I like to think about this is the challenge in public sphere, the goal, is the following question. How do you convince a group of strangers? that don't know you, who don't believe what you believe, to take action on your ideas? How do you communicate in such a way, right, that a redneck in Alabama can say, I don't know this Indian dude in Canada, but I resonate with his ideas, so I'm going to watch his stuff anyways. If you can master that and get people that you would never normally meet over the course of your life to buy into you and take action on your ideas because they matter, then you master public speaking. And the other way of thinking about it is that the quality of your presentation lives and dies by how engaged your audience is. That's why it's so important to not just think about your audience, but to talk to them, to get to know them, right? Sure, this is an interview about me, but it also gives me a lot of perspective on who you are and who's watching my stuff because the biggest lesson I got is I didn't know Redneck in Alabama was even watching my videos. That didn't even seem like a thought when I started Master Talk. 
right? So it's crazy to see how, how, how such a small channel could have such an impact on people. So we're always learning from our audiences. And the more that you dive into their psychology, the more that you understand what they're trying to get and what they're trying to learn, the better your content and your message becomes. Who's the redneck from Alabama? That you <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know after the call. <laughs> All right. <laughs> nah, but I mean, you seem like a very intellectual, intellect young man, uh, intelligent young man, if you will. Uh, what was your major at college or university? Yeah, so so I majored in accounting, and I, I wasn't a big fan of it. But uh, I I think I, on the topic of intelligence, how do you build that? I I don't think it's about like me being smarter than anyone else or being an intellect. I think it's more about asking ourselves the hard questions about life. And, and most people just don't do it. So, for example, questions like, what are you pretending not to know? If you had all the money in the world, how would you spend your time? And if you wrote your own funeral speech, what would it say? It's not that one person is smarter than the other, Joe. It's that one person decides to answer those questions for themselves and craft their own future and their own way of living life. Let me ask you this. Uh... Did you ever study rapport? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm actually completely organic. I'm self-taught entirely. I never had any money, so I could never hire anyone or take a class on it. So I'm I'm, I'm self-taught. I think it goes back to this idea of understanding the psychology of people. So so before this conversation, I, I, don't, I don't have the context, but as I talk to you, I start to understand more and more of your needs. So... For example, there's a reason why on my YouTube channel I don't use complex jargon, right? So things like glossophobia, though for those who are listening, you don't need to know this, but basically what it is, it's the medical term for the fear of public speaking. But that stuff doesn't serve you. That stuff is complicated. That stuff is useless. That stuff doesn't add value. So I'm always focused on who my audience is and what their psychology is. And what I'm realizing from this discussion is that Somebody I've never thought would watch my videos is watching it, so I'm probably doing something right with the way that I'm communicating. And that analogy also applies to you. I mean, when Joe Rogan, who has the number one podcast in the world, started interviewing people, he sucked. Like, he was on a, a web... He was on worse than this. He was on a webcam with, like... And back then, it was, like, 2008, and you didn't even know what a webcam was back then. And he practiced and practiced, and after 1,500 episodes of three-hour interviews... Now he's pretty good at what he does. It takes time, right? It's a process. Yeah, I agree. It, it does take time. It is a process. Uh, something that I work on every day. You know, it's hard, you know, when you're sitting there talking to a person like, you know, Jim the Rookie Moritz. And, you know, you, you know, this person has been on major news networks and made, they made a movie about the man. And here I am trying to interview him and it, you know, it gets kind of intimidating. Like, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, wow. I am with you. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't know if you ever seen the movie, uh, Disney's the rookie. Have, have you seen that movie? I it's about a major league baseball player that he was a school teacher and he went into, uh, made the major leagues, major league baseball. And oh. he was like, he was my age at the time. No, he was younger than me, actually. He was 35. But for a 35-year rookie in the major league, you know, in baseball, that's, like, unheard of. And uh, awesome. so they made a movie about it. And wow. I had interviewed him. And he was, like, my first big name. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and so, and I know it's, this is an intriguing story. I know. Yeah. Uh, so I remember talking to him, and I'm just so – I. If you watched the video, I was so intimidated. Like, why? Why does? And it kept in my mind, I kept thinking to myself, why does this guy want to talk to me? You know, well, what's so special about me? I should. This guy, he obviously thought that he was on a YouTube page with thousands of subscribers. You know what I mean? He obviously <laughs> did look. But I kept that was the whole thing going through my mind the whole time. So, on your YouTube page, you know you. You got stuff like how to present a boring topic, five mistakes to avoid with body language. Uh, so let's do some uh, let's do some uh, studying here, if you will. We've been online for 22 minutes. You can tell me right now what I've done wrong. I won't take offense to it. 
what I've done wrong, what I've done right, uh, what I could work on. Right now, you educate me on camera for the millions of people to watch. <laughs> you tell me what I, I do, what I do right, what I do wrong, and go. Right. So I, I think the best thing that we can do since since you're getting started with your journey that's practical and actionable is you need to ask yourself, and I'll send you resources after the show's over, but you need to ask yourself, if you were to model your interviewing style to anyone that you admire, who would that person be? And what do you think that they have that you are still working on? So let's say we used, I don't know, Larry King as an example. Right? I'm sure you're familiar who Larry King is, right? It's a good no, example. I'm, oh, you're not? Yeah. You know, yes. Oh, okay. Let me use a different one. Cause he's like interviewed right. sixty five thousand people. Larry King is yes. Oh, you do. Okay, I'm just making sure. I'm not sure, man. I don't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't be sarcastic. I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell. But anyways, the point is, is uh, yeah, so we got we got cable down here in Alabama, man. It's not just Canada. It's hey, not don't mock me. Don't mock me, Joe. <laughs> I'm just. I'm not sure, man. I, I just want to make sure I'm not saying something, and we're, we got we're off we're off this we're off page. But anyways, the point that I'm making with King is that there's a certain way in how he interviews, right? So let's say your, your goal is to be like him. Well, you, got, you have to think about, okay, well, how does he prepare for his guests? How does he think about the way that he interviews people? How does he vary his vocal tones? And you want to try and mimic what a lot of your favorite interviews do. So what happens is as you copy people bit by bit, you start to develop your own style. That's what I did when I started. So I've been speaking now for five years, but in the first two years, I was trash. The reason I was trash is because I don't have my own you, you, my own speaking style. So what I did was I started looking at Simon Sinek, Seth Godin, you know Scott Harrison, people who are really amazing speakers that I admire, Tony Robbins, and I took little bits and pieces on what they did well, and I applied it to myself. Right. So that's what I think you should be doing more of. So for example, you know, preparing a list of questions, <laughs> since you had a lot of material to work on, that helps. The second one that many podcasters don't do enough of that I would say, so I've probably been on 200 podcasts as of now, two, 300, I lost count. But I would say out of all of them, maybe five or 10% of them actually did a lot of research on me. So let's say like, like Tom Billy, who's a good example of this. He has a pretty big, big show called Impact Theory on YouTube, like 1.7 million followers or something on his channel. But what he does is he spends an average of eight hours researching each of his guests. Like he's obsessed. Right, so when he does his introduction, you're just the guest is just there, like, holy shit, how does he know this much about my life? It's kind of weird. But basically, the advice for you is you want to listen to what other guests, like the guests that you have on, you want to listen to other shows that they've been on. And you can always ask the guest, you could say, hey, I'd love to do more research on you. Can you send me, out of all the shows you've done, what are the top three? And you could spend, like, as you're walking, getting some exercise, doing your daily errands, you could listen to the episodes that the other person was on, and you can craft better questions that the person hasn't answered yet. Dale Carnegie is the author of the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and he's wildly regarded as one of the top public speaking experts in the world, or that used to be, when he was alive anyways. But the issue to that story, the sad part about the narrative, is he was born in the wrong time period of history. Because the best way to learn public speaking is by looking at someone like me who's speaking, right? But we didn't have access to this type of technology that we're using right now to talk to each other that Dale didn't have access to in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So basically, the goal with Master Talk is to do what Dale wasn't able to do, which is to democratize, or rather, or I guess an easy way of explaining democratization is like sharing the information for free, everything that there is to learn about public speaking, so that when I die, when my time's up, people can learn from me forever. So that's the goal with Master Talk. Uh, like two, two more questions. What do you think is the biggest mistake speakers make these days? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a great question. I think the, the, the biggest mistake that people make is they don't know how to practice. So let's say we take any skill, like piano. Piano is a good one I like to use. You know, you're playing piano, you've got two options. Option one is take 15 songs and figure it out, which won't work unless you're Mozart. And option two is saying, let me practice one song. One song until it's perfect. So let's assume you do that, Joe, and we're walking in a park in Alabama and we see a piano. And you go, hey, Brendan, you know, I've been playing this piano song for three months. Let me go try it. So you sit down at the piano, you start playing. And obviously you're nailing it because you've been practicing so many months. And then a crowd starts to gather around you. They go, Joe, 
you're so amazing at the piano. You're so great at this. And you go, oh, you know, no big deal. You know, I'm pretty good at this, even if you only know one song. When you go back home, you think to yourself, you go, well, if I know this one song, I can probably learn any of the songs. And then that confidence boost that you get makes you a great pianist. And that analogy we apply for anything. When it's your hunt, when it's your first interview, you're not very good. But when it's your thousandth interview, you're much better. Same repetition. When you start cooking for the first time, you have no clue what's happening. But when it's the 200th time that you started cooking, now you're understanding something. Now you know the technique. YouTube, podcasting, video, any skill is repetition, except for public speaking. We don't do that. When it's Wednesday and our boss or client or teacher tells us to give a presentation for Friday, we go, uh, looks like I'm not talking to my family for two days. So you go back home, you put some slides together, you figure out, you present. That presentation you put so many hours in, you crumble it up like a piece of paper, throw it in the garbage, and then move on to the next presentation. And that's the issue. If you want to be exceptional, you need to present one presentation hundreds of times. Now, with the product that you present on your YouTube, how could somebody in, in their everyday life use it? Uh, say, for example, a salesperson or a uh, engineer or, hell, even a shoe salesman. How could yeah. they use what you know into uh, their everyday job? Here, here's how I see it and how I spin it, Joe. Public speaking is everything. It has nothing to do is just presentations. I, I agree. And that's the reason why I, I, oh, I think speaking is, is everything. Absolutely. Don't worry, I was going to build on that. <laughs> so it, it's, it's not just the presentations, it's the conversations we have with our loved ones, more specifically the tough ones. It's the, the time that we meet somebody for dinner for a couple of hours. It's the first date that gives us nerves. It's the way that we influence people to give us a job. It's the way that we influence people to keep our job. It's the way we influence people to get promoted in the job. It's everything. So the better that we focus or the more that we focus our time on mastering the art of communication, the more effective that we'll be, not just with our communication skills or ability to get promotions, but in life too. So last question, uh, body language, uh, building rapport, what are the sources besides your YouTube page? Would you probably send someone to look for those things and learn how to get better at those things? Right. So, so I'm a bit peculiar in the sense that the only resource I would recommend besides my own channel is a book called Thirst by Scott Harrison. So Scott is not only an exceptional communicator, storyteller, and marketer. He's also a personal hero of mine. He's the CEO of Charity Water. So it's a nonprofit that helps people gain access to clean drinking water. And he's just a, he's just a savant. If you think I'm smart, like that guy is just on a whole other level. And he used to be a nightclub promoter in New York. So he has a very interesting story. Uh, so I recommend Thirst by Scott Harrison. I think it's an excellent read for anyone who wants to level up their storytelling and public speaking game. Well, today was a very interesting day. Uh, very, uh, it's not every day I get to talk to somebody from Canada. So uh, I'm glad you finally graduated the university because uh, he's down here. We call it college. Just, just anyway. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> but anyway, man, Brandon, it's good to talk to you, man. Uh, this is the time where you can plug something. Uh, you know, plug the YouTube page, plug your new book, plug. <laughs> Anything that you want to plug, my man? Yeah, for sure, man. So, so for those who want to check out the the YouTube channel, it's Master Talk in one word. And if you want to check out the Instagram page, it's Master Your Talk. You can send me a message over there. I'm always happy to chat. All right, Brandon, you stay on line. Everybody else, this has been another Sunday interview. Make sure you subscribe. And every uh, Brandon, stay on the line. I got one more question. And everybody else, see you next Sunday. Here at Careless Treasure Shop, you can get. <laughs> You can even order ah. your own championship belt. Ah. Come on, ah. Shop at Kaylin's Treasure Shop, where you get the best deals on anything. Hey, go go, it's And don't forget to order your championship belts.